Financially Smart Divorce. That's our topic today. First, I want to say divorce is never financially smart. It's kind of a bad title. You know, as a but as a financial planner, I don't recommend divorce. It's bad for your finances. However, you can go through it in the most financially smart way. So it hurts you the least. So to leave both of you in the best possible financial situation. So now we've seen lots of people go through divorce. Uh, we've seen disasters, uh, you know, where they're fighting through their lawyers years later with huge legal costs. Saw a case where it was 15 years later and a wife was going, she was now on to lawyer number six, trying to find something else she could she could use to go back against her ex. We saw, uh, we've seen a couple people de uh, declare bankruptcy to try to get out of alimony. We've seen, you know, things change, like someone's income goes up or down. And so, um, so you know, people, because they're their uh, their ex got a big raise now they're back fighting for more alimony or people who you know are, are have lost their lost their job and are trying to fight for much lower alimony i've seen lots of fights 10 15 years later thousands or hundreds of thousands even in legal bills i've seen disasters then the other hand we've seen some really great ones you know if you know, we've seen people be completely amicable and and still work through everything. And and uh, so we've helped clients go through it very amicably. And that's the best way that you can possibly do it. Try to, you know, make it without hurting each other too much. And so like the, so the best ones we've seen is where uh, where they actually um, be, are able to talk through everything um together and they decide amicably on how to do a split and they they work it work it all out they get they they just get the lawyer to write it up but they have a minor amount of expense and and they some of them even stay friends you know afterwards so um but and so what we do with our clients is we help them we've had a reasonable number of our clients go through it and we help them with the financial part of the of the separation so they get their legal advice, but we help them with the financial part of it. So how do you do the split so that you're both in reasonable shape? You don't want to basically divide your assets in half and then decide on the, on the support. So how do we do it in the most responsible way? And we can show it how to we can show them how to do it where there's the minimum amount of tax involved. Because of course, if you have to pay any tax at all, it means you both get less when you're getting half of it, right? So now I just want to say I'm a financial planner not a lawyer so the insights here in this in this video are all about uh our experience what we've seen with with actual clients and what works financially okay what we're going to learn today is um how what why an amicable divorce is better what to be aware of with lawyers working effectively with your lawyer how to define divide your assets the most effective way should you keep the house? What happens to the Smith when we're in a divorce? Should you split a pension? What options do you have with spousal and child support? And you know what studies say about life after divorce and how the, how the two tend to do. Okay, so let's first talk about why an amicable divorce amicable divorce is better so you know it's rare that a couple never see each other again after divorce especially if you have kids it's going to be you're still going to be in, in each other's lives it's important to be good role models for your kids so you don't want them stuck in the middle uh, or blaming themselves we can't see cases where the kids somehow think it's their fault so being able to talk amicably and try to talk to get along makes your future of life much better so also being able to start a new life with the right outlook means you need to to let go of the old one, start creating your own life. So an ongoing fight keeps emotions high. So then if you're fighting, then you're not letting go. So here's kind of the insight. Hate is a form of love. It's not the opposite love. So the opposite of love is apathy. You don't care. So, so hate is, you know, a strong emotion, just like love. So let love... Uh, let letting go means you don't have strong emotions, either love or hate. So now the, the best divorces I've seen, 
The couples could talk amicably about anything. They share custody. They live relatively close, even in the same school district, so the kids can go back and forth between their homes, but yet still go to the same church uh, school, even be in the same school bus. Uh, they cooperate on on times and when they see each other. They speak highly of each other to the kids, and some of them are actually, you know, they're actually friends. In the future, I've seen the cases where they both are remarried and the four of them get together as friends. So that's, you know, those are the best cases scenario. It may sound odd, but those are the ones that really, you know, have the least damage in anything they do. So you know, having your lawyers fight and negotiate for you means you both get less. So it may be a lot less if it's, you know, some of the disaster cases we've seen. So now remember, you both have rights. So you see your lawyers, you find out what your rights are, and you have rights, but you but you can agree to anything that you think is fair. Just because you have your right to something doesn't mean you necessarily have to do it. So you don't have to get every last thing you're entitled to. It's more important to get a reasonable settlement at a reasonable time and move forward with your life. So, so basically, assume that you will both have half the net worth that you do when you're together, and that your cash flow is going to be le less because between the two of you, you're paying for two homes, so you're going to have somewhat less, uh, you know, somewhat less money. So, now, what to be aware of with lawyers? So, first of all, lawyers are motivated to prolong your dispute. Okay, so they're trying to help you, but you know, the more, the longer, and the bigger your dispute goes, the more they get. So, remember that that's what they're kind of motivated to do. So, now they may sound like they're on your side, trying to fight for every little bit, but you have to stop and think: Is it actually worth it for what? For what we're going through and what it's going to cost and and you know to drag this thing on so and they, they may spend a lot of time on many details that you know may not be worth it from your point of view so now the way to work effectively with your lawyer so this is the advice that we give to our clients you're working with, with your lawyer first of all it's good that you um you separate you both find your own lawyer and have an initial meeting just to find out what your rights are. Talk about the situation, show them your situation, find out what your rights are. Then you meet with us or you meet your, with your financial planner and decide how to divide the assets effectively. I'm going to show you in a minute how to do that. So then discuss, you know, you discuss who gets what, uh, where you will each live, uh, who gets custody of the kids and all that, what support are you going to pay? You kind of discuss all that, decide together what to do. And we, we try to help our clients work through all that, all that financial stuff. Then you can go back to your lawyers and get one of the lawyers to write it up and the other one signs with it. And the result is you get a pretty good deal and it's a minimum of tax cost and it's a minimum of legal costs. And that's really how you get the best deal for both of you is that it's basically even, but you didn't waste money on, on uh, tax or on legal bills. So now how to divide your assets the most effective way. So again, having your lawyers fight and negotiate for you means you both get less. It's better to just know what your rights are, and then you look at it and decide what, you, what you're going to do. So now so let's talk about how to divide the assets. Okay, let's talk about how to div divide the assets. The first thing you do is, you, is create a net worth statement. Just find out everything that you have. So you list it all, and you put in whose name is it today. It's in the husband's name, the wife's name, or joint. And, you know, you put all the different assets in, in whose name that they're going to be. So uh, so there's some things you need to get a value for. So now you need to decide on an effective, effective the official separation date. Now, sometimes it's pretty obvious. One of you left, that's the date. But sometimes it's, you know, like we've seen couples where they've, you know, they've decided that they're done, they've, they're finished, and yet one of them still stays in the house for, they both did still stay in the house for a while. So there's some discretion as to what the effective date is. Decide on one because all the assets have to be valued on that day. So you create this net worth statement that looks something like what, what you see on the screen here. So um, now the home value, um, you want to try to see what it is. I mean, you, you can, you know, if the best thing to do would be to get an appraisal done, get the bank to do it, even as if you're going to refinance the house, get an appraisal done, find out what an official appraiser does. That's the most accurate. Uh, you can also just get a real estate agent to value it. Now, real estate agents tend to be 
on the high side because they're hoping that you're going to list it with them. So now remember, if if one of you is going to get the house, that person wants kind of the, a lower value, the one who's uh, or a higher value, the one who's not going to get it is going to a lower value. So sometimes you can, you know, you can get a real estate agent and there's worry that you get to get your agent and say, look, I want a low number, give me a low number. And the other one says, I want a high number. So sometimes what some couples do is they each get a real estate agent to write up what it's worth. They pay them something for it, but then they take kind of the average of the two. But basically you want to find out with a somewhat objective way, what's the house actually worth? The other thing that needs to be valued sometimes is if you have a pension, like a defined benefit. So two types of pension, there's a defined contribution, which looks like an RSP, and you just take the investments, what they're worth on that day. But the um, the defined benefit, so there what you're getting is a, you know a future pension. So what's it worth today? So you can actually write to the administrators and ask them for a value. So they call it, it's called a commuted value, basically what the pension would be worth today, and they can give you a number, and then you can actually put it on the uh, on the net worth statement because it's part of part of what the collective um, you know net worth that that you have. So in some cases, that number uh, lawyers will discount it because that's all before tax. Remember, that's all got to be uh, you know a million dollar pension, for example. You got to pay tax on it as you take it out. A million dollar home is tax free. So they're not actually quite equivalent, right? Same thing as an RSP and a TFSA. RSP you have to be tax on when you take it out, TFSA don't, you don't. Sometimes lawyers make that different, uh, you know, account for that. Sometimes they don't. But okay, so you get the value on your separation date of all your assets and all your liabilities. You put the, you, you know, you put them on there, you see what the total net worth is, then you each get half. Now there's cases where you don't get half. For example, if you had some asset before you get together and that asset stayed separately, or or you got a you got an inheritance and you kept it separate, you didn't merge it in. So, so, or you had an account that you had before you're married and you've never merged it with, you've never contributed to it. It's all been, always been saved separate. The lawyers can often make a case that that's not part of your combined assets, but, you know, so they have the family assets. The home is always part of it. Um, now, so then what you decide is, okay, so who's going to get what now? Like, so you have to decide who lives, who's going to live in the house. So somebody gets the home, somebody moves out and either rents or buys another place. Um, who's going to get all the investments? Who's going to get which debt? And then you get to the bottom and whatever the difference is, you divide it by two and the person with a higher amount owes the other person that amount of money in some way, either with moving some of the assets in or sell and giving them cash or in some way so that's kind of the process of deciding on uh, on the half okay so now uh investments you kind of have to look at each one so so non-registered investments if you switch them over there could be tax if it's switched over to a new person it, it's considered uh, a deemed disposition there could be tax involved um uh, normally but there isn't if it stays you know with the same person rsps and tfsa's Normally, whatever's in your name stays in your name. Even if you have spousal RSPs, you tend to usually stay in the same name. And you can switch them over, but you need a court order. Your lawyer has to apply for a court order to move, you know, move an RSP from one name to the other. So you can do it, but it's, it takes more work and it's legal fees involved in doing it. So most of the time you try to keep them in the same name. OK, so uh, debts are also you keep them you keep them kind of kind of the same. And basically, you're trying to stay in the same, you know, make sure that you're both in not too bad of a shape. So that's kind of the process. We kind of help our clients work through that that process, deciding who's going to live uh, where you want to make sure both of you are in decent shape also going forward. But it's but you're equal to half or close to half that you're both happy with it. Now, next question is, should you keep the house? So this is kind of an interesting thing is often both both want to stay in the house. Why? Because, you know, like moving is you got to get your stuff and move and find a new place. And so it's much easier to stay in the home. Uh, in actual fact, more often the wife stays in the home and the husband moves out and especially when there's kids involved. But that's, you know, anything, whatever you guys decide can can actually happen now. Um, 
the difference there is you're, you're looking at which assets that you get and what actually makes a difference. So now this is I, just the chart here. I'm showing you an example. This is the, you know, so what's happened here in Toronto, where area where I am, the, uh, the last 45 years, actually going back to 1975, it's like almost, you know, almost 50 years. So this purple line down here is the average house price in Toronto. And these three lines up here are the stock market. This is the red is the Canadian stock market. Blue is global. Uh, light blue is U.S. So you see the growth of the stock market is many times higher than real estate. OK, so, for example, last 45, 50 years, uh, Toronto, the Toronto stock market is here has done five times the growth of Toronto real estate. And that's a period of time. It's the best ever in history for Toronto real estate, and yet a bit below average for the Toronto stock market. And then, you know, global and U.S., of course, you should mainly have, you know, most or the bulk, pretty well all your money outside of Canada investment-wise. They've done even much better than that. So now what studies actually show uh, you know, you look a couple separate and you look five or 10 years later to see how the two of them did. And what actually has happens in most real life cases is in most cases, the husband has done better. Why? Because generally the wife gets the house, the husband gets the investments and they grow much faster. And, and five years later, he's ahead. So now that's, I, I think that's maybe a wake up for some people, but that's what actually tends to happen in most cases. So now a home isn't necessarily a bad investment. Okay. So here is why. So when you buy a home, you typically put down 20%. So you've got 20% of your money in that's five to one leverage, right? Cause it's, you, you buy a million dollar home, you only put 200,000 down, $400,000 mortgage. It's a five to one leverage. So now I have people come to me to try to say, you know, like, it's, you know, real estate, how does real estate compare to the, you know, in, in stock market investments. And so, you know, if you compare a million dollar property to a million dollars in the stock market, over time, the stock market is probably going to have five times the growth of, of real estate again. So, all right, or more. So, however, what actually happens often is you you have 200,000, you put 200,000, that's your equity, right? You have 80, you have a big mortgage on your home. So you have 200, it's 200,000 equity. That's all the equity is worth versus 200,000 in the market. Well, now you're comparing a million in real estate to 200,000 in the stock market. And then, you know, probably real estate will do better if you have that comparison. So, however, you know, it is possible to do, you know, three for one loans, like you can do investment loans. So if you actually have 200,000 down on a million dollar property or $200,000 on a million in the stock market, again, the stock market is going to do way better. So the key point is, if you're the one that's taking the house and there's a really big mortgage on it, it can actually turn out to be a decent investment. You get the house and the big mortgage, but you, so you haven't got that much of your money that's in, your equity that's in there. So it can actually be a decent investment. If the house, if the mortgage is paid down a long way, then you're generally going to be better off taking the investments and not the home. Okay, just a little interesting insight. So what happens to the Smith maneuver in a divorce? So you're doing the Smith maneuver and you split up. What happens? So first of all, the Smith maneuver, uh, part of it is a mortgage. You know, it's linked to the mortgage. So it usually stays with the home. Whoever gets the home gets the mortgage, gets the Smith maneuver most of the time. So now the Smith maneuver includes investments that are non-registered, meaning they're not RSP or TFSA or anything. So, so which usually are best to go to the person that has been claiming it to, a, you know, to avoid tax. So, um, so if it, so if it does not go to the same person that has been claiming it, then there's a deemed disposition and you owe tax based on it. So effectively the assets are sold to claim the capital gain. Then the other spouse can take over the Smith Mover uh, introductions and the investment growth from there on in. Now, if you have uh, the investments in joint name, for estate planning purposes. So that's normally how I would do it. You're doing the Smith Maneuver, regardless of whether you're going to be de uh, deducting the interest and, cl and claiming the interest jointly or one or the other. Usually you have the investments in joint name for estate planning purposes, but you can still have only one person, I either one, claiming everything. So, so if you have the investments in joint names for estate planning purposes, but one spouse... Um, uh, 
uh, one spouse has been claiming the Smith maneuver, you can switch everything to the spouse that has been claiming it without any deemed disposition or disposition or tax cost. So, for example, if the if the the wife has been claiming it up till now, a higher income person maybe, even though it's in joint names, in the split, if the wife now takes the takes the investments, it was uh, it was tax. Remember the taxable ownership. And the legal ownership of investments can be different. And the actual legal ownership is the actual name they're in. Taxable ownership is how you're recording it on your tax return. So if the one per, the one spouse has been always claiming it, you can take the other person's name off and keep with that person. And there's no tax costs involved. So now if the spouse has been um, been claiming Smith maneuver is, if that, that has been claiming it is not keeping the house, um, you can get a new home or credit line to take over the investment credit line. The credit line should still be tax deductible if you transfer the tax deductible credit line to a new credit line on the new home. So let's say, for example, uh, you know, the, the common example is uh, the husband's been making a higher income. You've been claiming the Smith maneuver on the husband, but he moves out. She keeps the house. Okay. So now what happens is so. Uh, to keep it, if you, if they decide she gets the house, he's going to get the investments, then um, uh, he can go out and get, he can buy a new home and get a credit line of equivalent size or get an, an unsecured credit line or something enough to take over the Smith Mover credit line. If you take the Smith Mover credit line over, you can switch the investments to, to that name only, and then there would be no tax on it. Okay, so so that's how that could be done without you were trying to do it without without paying tax if you can so now so if you if you have been claiming the smith maneuver jointly so you can keep half each without triggering capital gains and while maintaining tax deductibility okay so you've been claiming it both ways now you each take half of the smith maneuver you each take half of the debt and then it continues so again that would be without having uh, without having tax, you should be able to do without having tax costs. You have to make sure you try to do this, set it up right. But so now, if one person takes it over, there's a deemed disposition. One person takes it all over. There's a deemed disposition on the half of investments they didn't own, and then that person can continue to claim both interest and capital gains. So the deemed disposition means it's as if effectively that half of the investments is sold. You pay tax on the capital gain up till up till then. So again, there's a bit of tax paid, which means that you both get a little bit less. So, so part of it is you want to think through who wants to have the Smith maneuver. Like who's more comfortable with it? Are you gonna? This is a leverage strategy, which is not for everybody. So are you both like who wants to have it going forward? Also, in the asset split, how do you split it up so that who's gonna who's gonna take it, taking into account who's getting the house and who's getting the RSPs and all that. So the, the Smith maneuver is it's very helpful for saving for retirement without using your cash flow. So now one spouse can take over the existing Smith Maneuver, but the other spouse can restart it on the new home as well. So you can both you can both do it separately on your separate homes. So one question is who takes the existing and then do you want to continue, do you want to do it on your new homes? So, so that's the ins and outs of how you divide up the Smith Maneuver. So now let's talk about a pension. Should you split a pension? So I'm talking here about the defined benefit one. And we've had, you know, clients where they split up, you know, one of them is, is working for the government as a government defined benefit pension. Defined benefit that means your pension is based on a formula in the future. So you have to find out what the value is. So first of all, is you can you, you request a pension statement from the pension administrator, including evaluation, because, which is called the commuted value. Okay, so you need the statement to know what is it worth like on your separation date. So, and then what you can get your choices is you can actually get half of the pension when it's paid out. So it's paid out, the person retires at 60 or 65 and whatever pension that is, that it pays out per month, you can divide that by two, or you can take the current commuted value. Like if, if your spouse has the pension, you can take half of that pension value out uh, which is transferred to a, you know, you can transfer to an RSP or locked in RSP uh, to the extent that it's that it's allowed for. So you can just transfer out a lump sum or take a half of the future pension. 
So now that would apply to the portion of the pension that that was earned while you were together. So if you've been together for many years, as, uh, you know, since before the person started working for the company, the entire pension would be split. However, if they were working there, you know, 10 years before you got married, then it would only be the part that, you know, while you were together, that portion of it gets split. So uh, now again, the asset split, sometimes it allows for tax because remember the pension is before tax and other things are after tax. Um, if you take half of the pension payments, you know, the actual, when they retire, then you are dependent on your ex and when he or she retires. So we had a case like that where it was the husband that had a, had this nice defendant defend pension. They split up, you know, and they were still in their 40s. So it's 20 years later, they're going to they're gonna retire. And then it's a question of the wife is already retiring and the husband is, you know, is still working, but she doesn't get half his pension till whenever he chooses to retire. Right? So it's it that that part of it, splitting the future amount sounds nice. So I just get half of the pension, but it can be, it can be, be a problem if you, uh, you know, any financial tie is a bad thing when, when after you split up. And now you're dependent upon when your spouse reti decides to retire, you know, compared to when you want to retire. So usually the better, uh, the better way, it's usually better not to make financial ties, which means it's usually better to take the lump sum. So, okay, so half of the future pension payments means you still have a financial tie. If you're taking half of the lump sum, you don't. Also, if you're effective, you're equity kind of investors, taking out half of the pension is generally gives you a higher income because uh, pensions assume a 5% rate of return. If you invest in equities, you're going to make a long-term higher return than five. You're better off taking the lump sum anyway. And that can be done as part of, you know, now that you have this, think of the, the divorce as an opportunity to get half of the cash out of the pension. All right, so now let's talk about spousal and child support. So what do you do about that? So first of all, you like so we, we're actually very helpful with clients in figuring out how to divide their assets the best way so that they're both in decent shape. So it makes, because we know the clients, we know what makes sense for them and we can do it so we can, you know, avoid or minimize tax involvement. Support's a little different. Generally, you get those numbers from your lawyer, what spousal or child support you're going to pay. So now lawyers tend to do it based on there's, there's formulas for it. And there's, a, there's, a, there's websites for it. I'll show you this site in a, in a minute. For, for spousal support, there's a, a site, a divorce path, um, site and basically it is just a calculator of what what you get so now the guideline for spousal support is the paying spouse you know the higher income is presumed to have 40 percent of his or her net monthly income reduced by one half of what the lower spouse earns and, and that's kind of what the formula is supposed to tell you as far as how, how much spousal support is Okay, so now if child support is an issue, then spousal support is calculated after child support is calculated. Okay, now child support, again, there's a table, there's a lookup table on the justice.gc.ca site, I'll give you the link in a, in a minute, and you can just kind of look up how much the child support should be. So generally, these are just kind of very often, they're not negotiated, they're just determined by the lawyers, and that's what the number is. So. Now, with the with joint custody, there's a I think a lot of people think, oh, we take joint custody, therefore there's no child support, and that's often the case, but it's not necessarily the case. So, generally, officially, if there's joint custody, the higher income spouse is still supposed to be paying some child support. Again, that's your right; you don't necessarily have to decide on that. So. Now, the other option, in addition, other than you know taking this um, negotiated this spousal support and child support is to take a lump sum. So you can agree. So rather than getting, you know, 10 or 20,000 a year or whatever from you in spousal support, I'm going to take a one time hundred or thousand or 500, whatever, $200,000. And that's a one time amount. And then there will be no future support. Okay. Now, if you do that, there's no financial ties. Remember, if you're, if you're paying support, you still have a financial tie, which means you know, it's a bit risky. There could be an issue down the road. So now lawyers will sometimes, um, even if you negotiate a lump sum or something, or, the, or if your situations are very even, the lawyer, so that, you know, support wouldn't really apply. Lawyers will sometimes say, we'll just put a support for a dollar, a dollar a year. And you think, 
let's just sign up for a dollar a year. What's fine. It's only a dollar a year, but it's risky. And the reason is any amount of support can be renegotiated in the future. So we saw a case where the divorce had the, the separation agreement had a, um, a $1 per month support was agreed on. But 10 years later, they changed the one spouse who got a higher income and his spouse went back and that $1 a month became 5000 a month. So any amount, if there's any support at all, then, it, then the amount can be changed to any other amount. But if you agree to no support, then there is no support. So and that means there's also no financial tie in the future. So in general, I've, we've seen often it's we're getting uh, like better results, like ongoing support means you have to keep paying each other. And are you getting it? Is it late? And, you know, deadbeat dads and constantly, you know, going back and fighting, applying to the court for changes. So all these things can happen if you have ongoing support. Okay. But if you've agreed to it once, then it's done and there's no more. So it's a plus if you can make that work. And then what happened, whatever the amount of the lump sum is, it's part of the the assets of the you do is the asset split okay so now a lump sum the the way it's calculated it's done basically by multiplying you know the monthly amount of support that you should be getting you know child or, or spouse or child and multiplying the months that you would be getting that support and then discounting it based on you know inflation and tax and, and other factors so that's kind of the formula for doing it the lawyers will feel to figure out what that amount should be and then you can decide what what to do and then so i'm i'm not telling you that it should always be the case your lawyers may not may tell you not to do it i'm just saying that it can work out very well and from experience we've seen better outcomes where where a couple's you know they separate and they actually split they don't have any ongoing financial ties they agreed on a lump sum for this and there's no future support which means there's no future future fights about support okay so um yeah so um so be best results you know spousal support get your lawyer to calculate a buyout include include it when you do the assets uh, child support, often you can just agree on 50-50. And even if the lawyer is suggesting a, uh, a child support, you know, if it's a small amount, again, it's not worth fighting over small amounts. It's often better to let's let's have an agreement that's reasonable for both of you. And you decide on paying it or you decide on a buyout or something. But But those are the best results we've seen. Now, again, I'm not a lawyer. This is, you know, this is kind of where you get legal advice. But, uh, you know, I'm giving you the financial side to it, and I'm giving you insights from experience when we've seen couples split up. It's the ones that do it more amicably and don't have future fights and don't have ongoing debates about, you know, fights about support. Those are the ones that tend to work most effectively. So now, again, the most effective. So uh, most effective divorces we've seen, we've seen couples where it's, it's amicable. Uh, and again, that's the best way to do it. They talk amicably about everything. They have joint custody and share with the kids. There's no support payments or ongoing financial ties of any time of any type. No, they you know even took the lump sum out of the pension. There's there's no f ongoing financial ties. They live in the same school district, you know, so the kids can go back and forth. And you know, <laughs> you know, they may even be friends in the future, but. These are the situations where if you've got kids, you're always still going to be, you know, in each other's lives. So being able to get along and speak highly of each other, that's that is the thing that makes, you know, it's that makes it uh, most effective. You're not fighting over things. You're not wasting money on tax and lawyers and you're being a good example to your kids. This is the most effective way to do a divorce. So this uh, this screen here just shows you what the spousal support formula. This goes through the website. So there's the Divorce Path website, this site, and I'm, lawyers may use a different site, but this is they don't have sites where they look at. So th they look this up. It tells you what your child support should be and what the spousal su support should be, and you know can they compare it that way. There's a lookup table for the uh, for the um, child support. At this justice site, you can just look it up, compare your incomes. It should tell you what the standard amount of support should be. And that's how lawyers um, kind of give you the amount. And then from there, you can you know, ask, well, what would be the lump sum amount if we did it instead of accepting this? And then 
decide what makes sense for you. All right, so that, those, those are my, uh, that's my talk for today. So what we learned is why an amicable divorce is better, what to be aware of with lawyers, how to work effectively with your lawyer, how to divide the assets in the most effective way. We saw how to do that. Should you keep the house? What happens to the Smith maneuver in a divorce? Should you split a pension? What options do you have with spousal and child support? And what studies say about life after divorce? So, all right. So thanks a lot for listening. My name again is Ed Rempel. My blog is Unconventional Wisdom. It's the number one blog in Canada for a financial planner. Uh, it's at www.edremple.com. And if you go to that site, hit contact, you can ask for a free 30 minute consultation. And uh, to see if you want, if you're interested potentially in working with us, it's just a, a call with one of our financial planners to see what you're looking for and see whether or not we're a fit to work together. So please like and subscribe to my blog, YouTube, and I'm about to launch a podcast. So, and if you if you uh, subscribe to these, all that means we don't market in any way. All that means is you get all my new posts from the blogs and videos and uh, uh, sent directly to your email every week so that you're the first to see it. So thanks again for listening and we'll see you next week.